We got to do better than that. Come on, give me a hallelujah. All right. You may be seated. Whatever you're doing, do it in such a way the devil knows you mean business. And you're out to destroy him. So many people ask me in the States, uh, United States, because I go to nations, and almost every nation I go to, uh, lead them in war for their nation, and uh, decree and declare for their nation to be a sheep nation, and we come against principalities and powers, and they say, how in the world do you expose yourself to all of that and still come out safe? I said, I don't go by myself. I join with the brothers there and the, and the sisters, and we do it as an army. I don't do it as an individual. I do it as, as a corporate group. And uh, I said, I wouldn't dare go in and just by myself, but if, I, if I'm with them and they got a vision, a heart and spirit for it, we can do it. Amen? Amen. And um, we can actually declare it. You remember in Li Libya, they uh, went and declared a no-fly zone over Libya. They wiped out the Air Force and the communication channels. We can declare an no-fly zone over our area, wipe out the air force of the devil, and it always spirit communication channels. Amen? Uh, we didn't know, need to know our power and authority. Well, today I'm going to talk to you about the greatest gift. The greatest gift of God the Father was his only begotten son. He, sur he looked all of his counsel, his wisdom, searched all of his eternal purpose, his destiny, and there was no other, not a better, not another choice than to send his only begotten son. It was the greatest gift he could possibly give. No greater could God give than his only begotten son. Then when the son came at the will of the father, offered himself upon the cross, and the Bible says that God so loved the world, not only the people in it, but everything he created. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But Jesus came and he said, oh, Oh, God, I come to do thy will, and not my will, but thine be done, Father. And he gave his life on the cross. But the Bible says he didn't really do it for the world. He said he loved the church and gave himself for the church. And that's the reason he said in Acts 20, 28, he said, Feed the flock of God, which he's made, his, made you overseers, which he purchased with his own blood. So Jesus loves the church. So when he ascended back to the Father, he wanted to give the greatest, most blessed and possible gift he could give to the church. Jesus, God gave his gift to the world. Jesus gave his gift to the church in general. So he sent the Holy Spirit to convict people, draw people to God, to give us a born-again experience, to sanctify us, to enable us, to equip us, and to prepare us for God's eternal purpose. Then when, when the Holy Spirit came, he wanted to give the greatest gift possible. He searched all of God's wisdom, all of God's counsel, all of God's treasures, all of God's gifts, blessings, power, wisdom, and he searched and searched to get the greatest, most beneficial, the best possible gift he could give for the individual believer. And when the Holy Spirit came, he gave that gift of your own spirit language. Amen? It's the greatest gift he could possibly give. So if it's the greatest gift, if you've received God's greatest gift, Jesus, and you've received Jesus' greatest gift, the Holy Spirit, then you ought to receive the Holy Spirit's greatest gift, your other tongues. Amen? Your own spirit language. So I'm going to talk today about seven or eight of the 70 reasons for speaking in tongues. Amen? As I said yesterday, it's... 15 biblical proof reasons, and I'm not going to go into those because how many believe it is for us today? So I'm not going to take the time to give you proof text and explain it. Uh, it's in the book. You can read it later, and you know it. Uh, but there's 30 personal benefit and blessing reasons, 30. And there's 25 powerful spiritual ministry reasons. I discovered over the last 60 years that I would say 95% of Tongues talking Christians use less than 10% of the purpose and benefits of praying in tongues. They probably only have about 10% understanding and about 10% use of all that God. When I get through today, I hope you realize you, how many like to increase from 10 to 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe go to 100, amen? 
So I'm going to raise your percentage quite a level because you only appreciate what you understand to be valuable. And if you, see, if you don't know the value and purpose of praying in tongues, you're not going to do it much. But when you realize all the benefits, the blessings, all that it does for you, all that it produces in you, all that it produces through you, I'm telling you, you want to pray in tongues all the time. So we're going to talk about that. Now, um, this book, I wish I'd have, could have had a way of bringing them, but uh, it's being published right now in Singapore. Uh, one of my ministers, uh, David Lee, is going to, has got it, it's already be ready in time today, but they keep making mistakes at the printers. So, but uh, it, it is available there. But it's also available on Amazon electronically if you want to download it from all my books are on Amazon, I think. You can download them from electronically. Um, if any of you minister, every one of you ministers should have this in the hand of all your college level students and your young people. To know, because the Bible says you need to ha give a reason for the hope that lies within you. And you need to be able to, be able to intelligently and wisely show why you believe in speaking in tongues. And no one that speaks in tongues that ever feel peculiar or inferior to anybody else that doesn't understand it. Come on. And when you understand, you have the Holy Spirit's greatest gift that heaven could offer. God gave his best, his son. Jesus gave his best, his spirit, Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gave the best possible. In fact, in John 16, 7, Jesus said to the disciples, it's best for you, it's to your benefit, it's more beneficial for you that I go away than if I stay here in my mortal body. Now, what possibly... Could the 12 apostles imagine what could be better to sin better than him there personally? How many love to have Jesus with you personally? Well, he provided something better than him being there in the physical, in his natural body. And so he said, I got to go away. So that means Jesus said he died, had to die, not only to shed his last blood to cleanse us from sin, give us a born-again experience, but he also had to die to go to heaven to send back the Holy Spirit. So he died not only for our sins, but to send us the Holy Spirit, your own spirit language. Now, if he paid a price like that for it, I don't see why we should neglect it so much. We should appreciate it. Let me say, if you're going to be a part of the Third Reformation, you need to get fully activated in the Holy Spirit. And the, and the Holy Spirit's main way of activating the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, everything is spirit it can be activated by praying in tongues. God is spirit, and it's your spirit communication. It's your spirit language. We're both body, soul, and spirit. We're spirit beings and natural beings. We have ability to communicate in the natural because we have the power of speech. We're different than animals. We can speak and communicate. But we also have a spirit language for our spirit man. Amen? So we need to really understand that and appreciate it. So how many is glad you have it? Say amen. amen. Now, I'm going to just uh, take a few moments here to lay a little foundation, then we'll go into a lot of the benefits. Um, I believe it was Brother Macquarie that was talking about um, Hebrews. Hebrews is such a wonderful book. The two main words is new and better. It's a new, it's better. It's new, it's better. It's new, it's better. It's a new and a living way. Amen? It's a better sacrifice. It's a better, 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 newer. So let me tell you just a few things happened when Jesus birthed the church. I know some people try to just make Jesus an extension of Judaism, but it's a revolutionary whole new way. And let me tell you, the third reformation is going to be almost as revolutionary as the first reformation. We haven't seen it fully yet because we're pretty well still doing church as usual. But in the 90s, the prophets and apostles were saying, you won't recognize the church in the third millennial. It'll be so different. But we're still doing church the same old way and doing thing the same thing. But I tell you, we've got to get re, re understand what the purpose of the church. It's not just a blessing club. It's a training center. It's an armory to prepare God's people and equip them for God's purpose. Amen. So I mean, I'll just take a moment to read this because if I try to preach it, it'll take too long. The church is God's new race. Say, I'm a new race of mankind. It's a new people. It's a new generation. And the church is one generation from the first coming to the second. He said, a generation shall serve him. And the seed, and it's one seed, not seeds. 
And that's a whole new other study. But it's a new generation. Peter says we're a holy people, a holy nation, a new generation. It's a new people of God on planet Earth. A new nation, a church, church, God's, God's church, special nation people, as Israel was God's natural nation. A new house or temple for dwelling place, habitation of God on earth. How many know the church is built together as a headquarters for God on earth? Yeah. Ephesians, as you know, 2, 21, 22 says, we're being built together as a temple of God for an habitation of God. In the Old Testament, God built a temple for his people to dwell in. In the New Testament, God built a people for his temple. We are the temple of God. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, and he's a new, it's a new family of God, children of eternal Father God, made up of Jew and Gentile. Now there is no race distinction. I said there's no race distinction. Being born naturally a Jew doesn't do you any better than being born American or African or Asian or anything else. There's nobody has priority because of seniority or because of natural race. We're all one new creation. It's a new name for God's people, Christians. Isaiah prophesied there'd be a new name. Those who belong to Christ, a new body. Jesus was the body of God. Church is the body of Christ. How many believe the fullness of the Godhead will body in Jesus? Colossians 2, 7, 2, 9, is it? And so we're the body of Christ. Everything that Jesus accomplished in his body, human body, is now seen at the right hand of God, will be fulfilled in the corporate body. And if you don't understand that we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ and everything that Jesus is ever going to be, do, fulfill, and, and f f finalize, we are one with him in it being done. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. Thank God he didn't say I'm finished. But no, the work of redemption was finished. Amen. And the Father says, yes, it is. Now sit at my right hand till I make all enemies your footstool. Then Hebrews 4, 10, 13 says, he made the one perfect sacrifice, sat down at the right hand of the Father, waiting. Everybody say waiting. Amen. Waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Who is going to make him his footstool? Turn to your neighbor and say, you. You and I are the body of Christ called to put everything under his feet. Ephesians 1 tells you when he raised from the dead, he seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places, and he was given a name above every name that's named in the heaven and the earth, in the universe, anywhere else, that at that name, every knee is going to bow, every tongue confess. And he made him the head of the church, which is his body, and in that body dwells him who fills a whole wide universe. Amen. One of these days, we're going to wake up and realize who we are, what we have, what our calling is, and what we're anointed and de dedicated to accomplish and fulfill. So we've got to realize we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. I'm sure you've heard lots of teaching on joint heirship. How many have heard teaching on being joint heirs? See, if Apostle David and I were joint heirs of a million dollars, he doesn't get a 500,000, me 500,000, we have one million together to spend. Are you with me? And, and Hebrews 1 says that the son is heir of all things. So if he's heir of all things and we're joint heirs, we're heir of all things. He said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. He said, I give it to you too. And the main ministry of demons is to talk Christians out of believing they can be who God said they can be. They can do what God said they can do and they can have what God says they can have. That's the, main, that's the main ministry of demons because if we ever wake up and take our authority, hell has opened its white mouth for them. Amen? I don't have time. To, I just got to give that. I got to get beyond this. Come on. We have a new inheritance. Ephesians 1.11. We are, we are his and all Christ is and has is ours as overcomers. A new relationship, Jesus the bridegroom, the church bride, the bride of Christ. A new position in destiny, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. A new power and authority, same as Jesus, all power over all enemies. A new generation, church from beginning, first coming to second coming is one generation. A new language, and I've said all that to bring you to this. A new language. The body of Christ, when it was born on the day of Pentecost, something happened. How many were born in this world? 
probably the first thing they did was try to get you to make a noise. They might have spat at you and said, ah! you know. The first thing when the church was born, it said, <laughs> Come on. It breathed the breath of life, was born again, and started speaking in tongues. Hallelujah. And so I find there's a universal language of the church. It's a spirit language. All children of God around the world speak the same language. Spirit language. Come on. Each one's a different language, but it's a spirit language. All right. So that's for him. I, I wrote this. You know, the end result is God's new creation, people who have been born of the Spirit, living with eternal life in a resurrected, translated, immortal body, reigning with Christ Jesus under God's new heaven, on God's new earth, the center of God's endless universe. Now, you can go home, put that on slow speed, and then preach on that for an hour. All right. Now, I'm just kind of hitting a few things here that I want to do. Now, why the tongue? Why did God choose the tongue? Now, he could have made our ears wiggle or give us heart palpitations. He could have done a lot of things. But he chose the tongue. Well, James gives us an idea. He says the tongue is a ruling member of the body. It's like the horse's bridle bits in a horse's mouth. It's like the rudder of a ship. It's like the steering wheel of a car. It's a little member, but it controls the whole body. And it says the tongue can be set on fire of hell and defile the whole body. Well, when you speak in tongues, it's set on fire of the Holy Spirit, and it sanctifies the whole body. Amen? Now, there's two mighty miracles I like to talk about. The greatest miracle in the universe and in eternity is a born-again experience. It's a greater miracle when God created the heavens and the earth. Because when God created the heavens and earth, he had no resistance from anything. But when he causes a person to be born again, he gave him a free will, and he has to work with that. How many has been born again? You've experienced the father of all miracles. But the mother of all miracles is speaking in tongues. Because it says no man can tame the tongue, but the Holy Ghost can. And when you speak it, when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost and you receive your spirit language and start speaking in tongues, that's the mother of all miracles. So if that's the father and that's the mother, then the gifts of the spirit are the kids. It's soaking in. Land is soak all. You got it real quick. <laughs> you see, we've made the gifts way out here somewhere. Listen, if you've been born again of the spirit and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Gifts should be simple and easy. That's mom and daddy. That's the kids. It's all by the same spirit, same spirit, same spirit. And, and in here I show you that how the speaking in tongues activates the nine gifts of the spirit, activates the fruit of the spirit, activates the sevenfold spirit of God. Everything is spirit of God. It activates. It's an activator. You're gonna, you're, we'll show that a little more here. Okay. Now, I want to skip over a little more here. Jump over here. I want to get on the benefits. Hallelujah. Now, I like to call this message sometimes the 13th commandment. Moses gave two, 10. Jesus gave two in the Gospels. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God and love your neighbor. And the 13th commandment is Acts 1-4. Acts 1-4. He commanded them. Everybody say commanded. He, command, he didn't say if it fits your doctrine, if you think you got time, if you would like to. He commanded them to go back to Jerusalem and don't do anything. Try to hold a conference, go preach a revival, don't write a book, go back and wait till you receive the promise of the Father. Now, when Jesus was with them, he kept talking about, I'll send you another comforter. I'll send you a helper. I'll send you the spirit of truth, the promise of the Father. It's about 10 or 12 Names, it all means the same thing as the same experience. Amen? So he says, now you go back to Jerusalem. And they say, well, Lord, you're going you're gonna to reestablish Israel as a kingdom? I I'm amazed how little they had any conception of the church. Jesus only mentioned it one time. But see, Jesus talked about the kingdom a hundred times in the four Gospels. And for the 40 days and 40 nights, he said he talked about the kingdom. 
And Paul, at his last, talked about the kingdom and the Lord Jesus Christ. But he had to build a church. He, he said, I build my church. I'll put the kingdom in the church. And then it'll go through a stage. One day, I'm going to mature the church, and they're going to birth the kingdom, and they'll demonstrate the kingdom to all the world, and that the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus and his anointed one, the church. Amen? I heard somebody say, well, it's not the church anymore. It's the kingdom. I said, how ridiculous. It's the church that demonstrates the kingdom. I said, it's the church that demonstrates the kingdom. You don't quit being a Christian because you start teaching on the kingdom. You don't stop being a member of the body of Christ until we've got a revelation on the kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But God had to build a people. It's like God told Abraham, I want you to possess Canaan, but you can't for two reasons yet. One, the sin of the Amorites is not yet full. Two, it's just you, Sarah. I see you. I don't know, yeah. Uh, Abraham, uh, Isaac wasn't there yet. Just the two of you. We need a whole nation. So you're going to go down and your descendants to go down to Egypt for 400 years. And they'll come back a great nation, millions of them, and you'll possess the land then. You know, there's three things that have to come together for the coming of the Lord. How many still believe he's coming again? I still believe the Bible says there is a literal second coming of Jesus Christ. He's coming, but not today. or tomorrow, or next week. He can't come until all things are fulfilled. Until all men and enemies are made his footstool. Amen? Now, that sounds so ridiculous and unbelievable to the natural mind. Every time I say it myself, how in the world could that be? But you know, God told Joshua and the children of Israel, I think it's a Deuteronomy about uh, 317 or somewhere along in there. He says, do not say, how shall we do this? They're greater than us. They're mightier than us. God says, don't say that. And we can't say, how are we going to do it? They're too mighty, too great. Don't make any difference. The greater they are, the harder they fall. David proved that with Goliath. Amen? We don't have all the revelation how. We just know it's coming. When you're prophetic, you see it, but you don't know all the answers, but you know it's there, and you're going to tell people it's there. We're going to look for it. We're going to believe for it. We're going to go for it, and we'll find out how to do it as we go along the way. Amen? So, one, I was talking to you about restoration yesterday, and one of the principles of restoration, every restoration movement took something that people spiritualized, put off in the future or the past or into a religious doctrine without life experience and made it real, right? From born again to really born again, from healing of the spirit and really healing for the physical body, from talking in tongues, Baptists saying it just speak a pure language, to literally you speak in tongues. And for years, we preach thy kingdom come, thy will be done in our heart, in our life, which is true. But now God's saying, expand it. Extend it to where God said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in Malaysia, in Muar, right where you live, in your nation, in your place. Did he mean it? Did he really mean for us to pray? There's not one place he said, pray to get out. I prayed to get out one time, way back had a car wreck just to learn to start driving. And I was, didn't know what to do, and I'm going to have to pay some money. And I, praying. And I said, oh, God, I want to go up and out. I want to go up and out. And the Lord said, isn't it strange? You're trying to get up and out, and I'm trying to get down and back. <laughs> I was kind of like the Jew that was in Israel at the Wailing Wall. And he was wailing. Oh, I want to go where my people are. And he kept saying that and saying that. And the Gentile came up and says, you're in Jerusalem. You're at the Wailing Wall. Why do you keep saying, I want to go where my people are? He said, where are your people? He said, Miami Beach. <laughs> That's in Florida in case some of you don't know. <laughs> I think they got more Jews in Miami than they have in Israel almost. All right. Now, Jesus said there's nothing more important than getting filled with the Holy Spirit and have your own spirit language. So let's talk about some of the benefits. There's a lot of benefits. 
Now, how many has been talking in tongues for over a year? And when you run out of time, you can let your hand down. One year. Well, at least one year you've had. At least one year. You've been speaking in tongues at least one year. Okay, five years. Ten, 15, who will make it 20? 25, 30, who will make it 40? <laughs> 45? 50? 55? 60? One? I have to stop at 63. <laughs> And just think how much greater you could be effective and productive if you knew how to pull upon the power and the blessings and the benefits of praying in tongues. So let's just look at a few of them. And um, let's take one, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 2. It says, he who speaks in tongues does not speak to men, but to who? So it's none of your business what I'm saying. None of my business what you're saying. Only if you jump up and try to speak a message in tongues, you got to give the interpretation. If you're taking up my time, then you better interpret. But if you're just praying to your God, it's between you and God. Amen? Nobody understands you. How be it in the Spirit you speak mysteries. Now what does that mean? Mysteries are the secret purposes of God not yet fully revealed. Paul said that ministry has been given to the holy apostles and prophets to take the hidden things that is not ready to be revealed and know God's timing. God reveals them. Like Paul said, God showed me the time for the church is now. It's been hidden for ages past. Ephesians 3, verse 3 through 5. But now it's made known unto his holy apostles and prophets. Amen? All right, now. What does it mean? I had an experience in 1953 when I was in Bible college. I drove down from Portland, Oregon to Salem, Oregon to preach. After the preaching, we all went to the altar. And the Lord said, get comfortable. I've got an experience for you. So I sat cross-legged like an Indian chief and got comfortable. And over the next four hours, here's what happened. I was sitting there, and it was almost like I was out here listening to myself. But my spirit would talk to God and through my language of the spirit, asking, requesting, worshiping. And then the Holy Spirit would speak back through my language, instruction, authoritatively, et cetera, et cetera. And that went on for four hours. I'd pray something like this. It's more in a Spanish or Italian or French language, more romantic language. And I'd, I'd, my spirit would pray, Uriba bakacha, no no maria, se mira kumuri atana ya shapaha, ruba kama, no mami atana, ja ja ja, morebe kino kanalaya. And I could, then it'd go about, about five minutes and stop. Switch, come back in a guttural African language or German or Russian, uka baha, no shakehe mohotona, nukubukiba, nukubabaha, nenga momohota naja, nukumaha ya naya. And it went on for four hours, five minutes up, five, down, down, upload, download, upload, download. Now, we didn't have computers in those days, but now I'm using modern terminology. <laughs> but my spirit would upload, then he would download. Amen? And he would reveal secret things and mysteries. He was downloading to my, from his computer to my computer, from his hard drive to my hard drive, from his spirit to my spirit, from the mind of God to my spirit. And said, so when you need it, it'll flash on the screen of your mind. Now, about three months later, the Bible college split right down the middle. Five of the state teachers left, and the president got up and said, they're harlings, don't go looking after them, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. We young people were so confused. I was 19 at the time, and, and we didn't know what to do. And so I was praying, fasting, and I was praying, and the Lord said, don't worry about it. And I'll put it in modern terminology. I've already programmed your spirit to direct your mind and your body to do the right thing. You will not make a mistake. You're already programmed. How many know a computer can only do what the programmer gives it to do? 
how many like to get daily programmed for your daily bed, daily direction, amen? And I've had several experiences like that over the years. God gives direction, amen? Now, there, I mean, God wants to communicate. Now, how many know the Bible says we have the mind of Christ? But we need it downloaded. I said we need it downloaded. And then we need the spirit of revelation to activate it to understanding. Hallelujah. Now, um, John 16, 6 through 16, talks about how the Holy Spirit will illuminate, bring all things to our remembrance, will reveal things to us. In other words, it will download and as we upload and download till we get revelation of God. Most of the time when I'm preparing a message, I'm talking in tongues. You know, I'm studying. Because, see, I, I can use this mind while I'm letting this mind work. I'm studying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, getting the download and upload while I'm getting the revelation, amen? Now, look, look at another one. I'm, I'm just skimming through this. This is going to be across the tops of the mountains, <laughs> all right? Psychological benefit. I won't ask how many ever been to a psychiatrist, but I had a 33 long play record back 45 years ago that a psychiatrist put out. He was speaking to 10,000 women at a luncheon, and the name of the record was 10 Ways to Go Crazy. <laughs> and he tried to prove people that can commit mental, emotional suicide just like you commit physical suicide. And, but he said one thing he discovered, it's hard to go crazy and have a sense of humor and be able to laugh at yourself and laugh at life. And he says, people that can never crack a smile, they're always just like a stone face. They can't relax and enjoy life about that far from the... I see several very close here today. <laughs> you haven't cracked a smile all day. You know, they're coming for you. All right. <laughs> all right. In the 60s and 70s, several psychologists received the gift of the Holy Spirit, and they wanted to know, analyze it and evaluate it and study it, and studied about hundreds of people that spoke in tongues. And after a couple of years' research and study, this one psychologist wrote a book back in the 60s and 70s and said this. He said, if I could get my people to pray 30 minutes in tongues every day for 30 days, at the end of that time, they wouldn't need me. Then he explained why. He said, what I do as a psychologist or psychiatrist, I keep asking questions and probing until I get them to open up and they talk out a trauma, something they went through that's buried, that causes them to act and react the way they do. We bring it to the forefront and I, I give them the truth on the matter and the truth sets them free. I mean, you know, Jesus said you should know the truth and the truth will set you free. And he said, when I pray in tongues, when people pray in tongues, they're praying from their subconscious. And the Holy Spirit will pray out traumas, longing desires, fears, anxieties, and pray it out and pray it out until it clears you. You got your own psychiatrist built within. You don't have to go crazy. <laughs> Amen. You don't have to have a nervous breakdown. Let me show you how this works. When I was a boy on a farm, my brother and I used to go hunting in a, several hundred acres of woods behind our farm. And we never would take water with us because we knew there was a spring of water back over an hour or two away. And we would drink and enjoy it to the full. But usually, those dumb dogs would get there before we did. And they would get there, and they wouldn't just lick water. They'd jump in it, and like we, you know, leaves and sticks and dog slobbers all in the water. We get there and we kick the dogs away and get down there and, and but the water's about a gallon every minute come flowing out of the heart of the earth and we would push the sticks away and push the dirt away and clear it away and push the dog slobbers away and, and pretty soon after about 10 minutes clear sparkling clean water. Come on. 
when you pray in tongues, I'm telling you, the dogs of life, I've got dog slobbers all over your life, and sticks and, and weeds and everything. You start praying in tongues, out of your innermost being flows rivers of living water that washes and cleanses and purges and purifies and sets you free. Amen? Hallelujah. Oh, God, thank you, brother. Hard to bend over anymore. Hallelujah. Amen. He woke up. Okay. <laughs> Romans 5.5 5 says the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by praying in our spirit language. Anytime Paul says praying in the Holy Spirit, praying with the Spirit, he explains what he means. 1 Corinthians 14, 14, he says, If I pray with my spirit, my understanding is unfruitful. How is it I will sing with the spirit, I'll pray with the spirit, and I can sing in my native tongue also. So anytime Paul says spirit, like he says, pray it always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, he's talking about praying in your spirit language. Okay? Jude, Romans 5, 5, The love of God is what? Shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Jude 1, 20, 22 says, keep yourselves in the love of God by praying in your spirit language. In other words, when you pray in your spirit language, it's a spirit activation. Come on. You're not blowing sawdust. You're praying in the spirit. And as you pray in the spirit, praying in tongues works in your spirit like your natural heart does your blood. It's just like your heart pumps blood throughout to every cell of your body as you pray in tongue it pumps the love of God to every cell of your being to every part of your spirit being and I'm telling you when God fills you with the love of God you got victory perfect love casts out fear the more love less fear more faith amen so if you, you can you can get full and saturated by praying in tongues when you pray in tongues just visualize your heart beating boom 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 you know blood flowing. Wherever the blood flows, the life flows. And you know, how many know where Paul says we're each one members of the body of Christ? And we're different. Eye, ears, nose, mouth, we're different. But when that blood flows to my ear, it starts hearing. My eye starts seeing. Same blood, same life. Mouth starts talking. Hands start moving. Heart starts beating. Lungs start breathing. And when you let the Holy Spirit flow into you, whatever your gift, whatever your calling, whatever God's given you a special grace, it'll activate that and start it to come alive and be demonstrated. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Now, 1 Corinthians 14, 4 and Acts 1, 8. The Holy Spirit language charges your spiritual battery. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 14, 4, he that speaks an unknown tongue Charges, edifies, builds up himself. You got your own charger. Paul said, uh, Jesus said, Acts 1 8, you shall receive power, dunamis, after the Holy Spirit gives you the tools to do it. Your own spirit language. I'll explain that in a moment. Let me explain how this works charge. There's two types of charge. One type of charge, how many has ever seen a movie on these big old battleships and they got these big round things? They, put them in there, and that's the charge to shoot the big bullets. How many like your gun to be charged? That's good to have bullets in your gun if you don't have charge. It's going to sit there. Come on. But if you've got that charge in there, when, when that hits, boom, whoosh, the enemy gets blown out of the park. That's the reason I try to get saints off their cruise ship some being sweet Jesus, seeker friendly, deadbeats, and get on their battleship and get to the gun and blow the devil out of the water. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. We can't be cruisomatics. We got to be warriors on the battleship of life. Hallelujah. Okay. Now, let me explain how that works. Years ago, about 1970, I think it was, I drove my big old Buick from. Let's see, we lived in San Antonio, Texas then. From Texas all the way to California, about almost 2,000 miles. I get there and, and do business and ministry, and in the next few days, I get back in my car to head back to Texas. And I turned the key on, and it went, 
Tried my horn, too. Tried the lights, psh. Now, I didn't know anything about mechanics in those days. Don't know much more today. But anyhow. <laughs> I just sing that song. If you got the money, honey, I got the time. And the mechanics, if I got the money, he'll gladly take it and fix it. Okay. That's his anointing. <laughs> but I had a friend there, and he had a little Volvo car, a six-volt. I had a big 12-volt. He said, well, we can jump or cable it. I said, what's that? He said, well, we got these cables, and I hook them on my battery post, and then hook it on your battery post, and I'll rev my car up, and you can start your motor. So we did that, and I tried it, click, click. We tried it for 10 minutes. Click. Realized his 6 volt wouldn't charge my 12 volt. I got a revelation. That's why some Christians pray for some people. They don't get any results. A 6 volt Christian trying to pray for a 12 volt, and they just can't get them charged. <laughs> Amen. I tried to get spiritual illustrations from everything. Amen. And so I said, well, what do we do now? He said, well, let's take it to the garage or service station. We took it over there, and they had a charger there. And I watched him as what he was doing, and he plugged it into the socket over there. And then he had this little machine, and it had a green here and red over here and a needle. And he had these clamps here that came out like a snake or something like that. And he clamped them on my two posts on my battery, and he turned on. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm checking to see if it's got a dead cell. So what's he said, well, if it's got a dead cell, I can charge it all day long, and it won't hold. Wow, I got another revelation. No wonder when you counsel and counsel and pray and pray and pray for people. They don't take. They got a dead cell of unbelief and sin, and until you get rid of that dead cell, you're not going to charge them. Amen. So I said, okay, okay. Uh, he said, do you want a 30-minute quickie or a long 24-hour charge? I said, I'm heading back for Texas. He said, well, if your generator is working, I'll give you a quick charge, get the motor started, and if your generator is working, it will build your battery going back. I said, well, I'm a Pentecostal background. Give me a quickie. Let's go. <laughs> so he uh, over and unscrews the tops of the, some little caps on my battery there, and and he fills it with water, and I said, what are you doing now? He said, I'm making sure it's full of water. It's got to be full of water to take the charge. Oh, another revelation. <laughs> Amen. So he leaves, and I said, nah, I'm, I remember watching. Being a Pentecostal background, I thought those wires would start jumping and flopping and flipping, but, but they just, shoot. But anyhow, I said, how am I going to know if it's taking the charge? He said, watch the water. So I said, okay, I'm watching the water. So in about 15 or 20 minutes, the water started going. Burp, 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 burp. I said, it's going. Burp, 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 burp. He said, it's taking the charge. Got another revelation. When you take the charge, you go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if you don't have a dead cell, we lay hands on you. That's like those clamps. Huh? You start praying, you're going to take the charge. And you're going to start talking in tongues. You know, when we first moved to our land at Florida, uh, we bought 20 acres and then more. We got about 80 acres now on the campus. And, but when we first moved there, it was mainly forest. And so we bought this great big old caterpillar, a uh, great, big, great big old machine to try to dig out the ponds and move some trees and fix some roads. And... Um, I think it's the one that Noah used to clean out the boat after he got the animals off or something. But it's old. And so it had great big old pistons. I mean, once you got that great big old machine going, boom, 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 but you couldn't put enough batteries on there to start it. So they had what they call a pony motor. Had the little pony motor to get the big horses going, horsepower, you know. I see you don't know any more about it than I do. Okay. <laughs> So uh, we had a, a brother that was a maintenance man, and he would get out there, and he'd pull that pony motor. Room, it'd go like a lawnmower. Brrrr, boy, it gets going real fast. And he's got that going real fast. He'd take a great big old lever, and he'd switch it. Woof. And when he did that, all of a sudden, a big old smoke would boil, and those pistons are going, boom, 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 boom. Push it, boom, it's going full. Then he could move dirt, move trees. He could take care of things. Well, you've got your own pony motor 
and the big pistons of the gifts of the Spirit, you can't just launch sometimes in them. You need your pony motor. And your pony motor goes like this. Thus saith the Lord, heal, deliver, cast out devils. Hallelujah. Amen. You, you got to have your pony motor. I remember back when I was prophesying by the hour over hundreds of people every night, and this Methodist lady came up, and she said, oh, brother, you know, you could prophesy over a lot more people if you didn't talk as much in tongues. I said, sister, after prophesying for four hours, my body gets tired, my spirit gets weary, and I have to recharge. And I recharge by talking in tongues. And I said, I have to recharge up good, especially to prophesy to somebody like you. But anyhow. <laughs> now, you've got your own pony motor. But the illustration I like the best is one that I learned in the early 50s when my wife and I drove close to Las Vegas down by the great Hoover Dam, and they took us down through the dam. We saw how the hydroelectric power plant worked. And that's where I first got my illustration of what speaking in tongues really does for us. How many has ever seen on television or uh, news or how many has ever been around a hydroelectric power plant? And, God bless both of you. Okay. But uh, how many have seen on television enough? Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. They build a dam across a river, usually, and it backs the water up, creates a big reservoir. Now, the water on this side of the dam, where the reservoir is, is good evangelical water. <laughs> you can go fishing, catch fish. You can take your boat out there and have some fellowship. Two fellows in the same ship. Amen. <laughs> you can go bathing. You can water baptize like Baptists do. <laughs> it's beautiful, clear, clean water. It's the same water on this side that's on the other side, but it's not producing any power. And the main purpose was not just to have a lake, but to produce power. So in order for that to happen, they have to fix the dam a certain way. They have overflow at the top, but down the lower part of the dam, they have water gates. And that water gate has a thing that opens hydraulically, and inside that water gate is a turbine. It looks like a jet plane motor, curved blades. And when they open the water gate, the water rushes through that turbine, and it starts to boom. And it starts turning the great big dynamo. I think they had about 15 of those great big, cover half this room almost. And the dynamo starts going, whoom, whoom. It's a wheel in the middle of a wheel like Ezekiel talked about. It's a gigantic generator. It's described as a mechanical machine that produces an invisible force called electricity. It can be seen and heard and produces an invisible force. Boy, did I get a revelation. Talking in tongues is something you can see and hear. It's mechanical at times. You just feel like you're a Dutchman going, katama, cha, katama. You know, but it's producing an invisible force called the presence and power of God. Amen? <laughs> so you open your water gate. You let the water stretch through, and it starts turning that dynamo. Jesus said, you shall receive dynamo. Come on. In Pentecost, we called it dynamite, so we just went to church and exploded. But it's a continual power-producing machine. Now, you have your own built-in hydroelectric power plant. Or it could be like the uh, one in Japan that got damaged, or that was, uh, what you call it, uh, nuclear, nuclear. And I, I noticed something about that. You had to keep the... Rods covered with water, but, but we'll go some. But anyhow, so you've got your own built-in power plant. You've got a water gate called your mouth. Open your mouth. I know you can't open as big as mine, but open. That's your water gate. It's like I told you about the Presbyterian brother trying to talk in tongue with your mouth shut. It's hard. You open your mouth, and inside that water gate, you've got a turbine called your tongue. 
And Jesus said in John 7, 38, 39, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Now, to some of you, when you got baptized, only got a squirt gun, we're going to pray for you for a river. Out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And said, this he spake of the spirit that he was going to send after he was glorified or crucified or resurrected and sent it back to the Father. So it's your spirit inner man, a river. you got your own reservoir. Amen? And you need it filled up so it's got the pressure to go through. So when you open your mouth and start praying in tongues, you open the water gate, and it goes over the turban, and it starts turning. And it starts turning a big wheel in the middle of a wheel, and it starts generating the power of God. There's never an excuse for a Christian to be low on power. You can produce it anytime, anywhere, any place you want to. Open the water gate, let the water flow through, let the dynamo turn, and you produce it. Hallelujah. Now, on a dam, they have to have transformers because that generates sometimes millions of votes. So they have transformers that take it to cities. Then when you get to the cities, they got smaller transformers on your electrical post, and it transforms it from thousands of votes down to one, 220 or 110. Right? And the Holy Spirit is our transformer. He says he gives gifts according to every man's several ability. If see, if the Holy Ghost came straight from the throne and hit you, it'd blow you up. It takes the transformer of the Holy Spirit to distribute severally as he will. He, has to, he knows how much your capacity is. He knows how much you can take. How many want to increase your capacity, increase your ability, amen? And so he does that. Now, there are also fuses and switches in a big power plant or dam. They have great big levers, gigantic. But in your home, you have little plastic switches. Now, a switch is, describes it as a little metal strip that melts or breaks when it overloads. See, some of you don't know how to let it overload. <laughs> and when you try to do too much, too quick, too fast, without the grace of God, it, it blows your switch. You're, it, it, it's like a car running without oil or gas, I mean oil or water. You're going to burn up. And, and, the, and a blown switch is fear. Fear is a switch blower. An active, lively switch is faith. Amen? And if you blow a fuse, it's not the end of the world. You can go, if you got some, and put another one in. And if you do lose faith and you don't get the job done, don't quit. Don't give up. Re refix the fuse. Put your faith back in gear. Kick out fear and unbelief and disobedience. Amen? All right. And, um, you know, there's two ways to build faith. And you need to do both of them. Romans 10, 17 says, how do you build faith there? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the rhema word of God. Amen? Now, when you pray in tongues, it says it builds up your most holy faith. Praying in tongues says builds up your faith. Builds up your faith. Cast out fear. It, it washes away all everything. And you can pray in tongues and build up your faith, but you also got to get the mind full of the word of God and send it to the spirit. Amen? And, and you can build up your faith. It says keep yourself in a holy faith by praying in tongues. Amen? Now, how many, begin, how many begin to see there's a little more benefit than you realize? You've got your own built-in power plant. You've got your own battery charger. You've got your own psychiatrist. And this, uh, a, a university did a study years ago, and they, they discovered that people that prayed in tongues a lot increased their immune system 30 to 40%. That little machine we did, check me out. My immune system's real good. Not everything else is, but because I pray in tongues all the time. And back in the 70s, I started flying on planes, 
Find it's the best way to fly so far. But anyhow, and I'd walk down the concourse, you know, and I start praying, everybody looked back at you. Now, 40 years later, I can walk down the concourse, nobody pays any attention to me. Everybody's going, everybody's talking to something invisible. Yeah. So then I walk down the corridors, I'll say, and they'll say, is it in his ear? Is it in his pocket? Where is it? It's in my heart. It's in my spirit. It's in my tongue. Hallelujah. I got my own telephone line direct to heaven. My own private line. My own private spirit language. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to give you a couple, a couple of more. During Desert um, Shield, the Gulf War, we were at our conf annual conference, and we'd had a great Holy Spirit service. God moved in a mighty way. But then God spoke to me and said, I want you to go to war because the enemy has plans to kill 60,000 allies, American and other allies. I said, I want you to go to war for 50,000 of them. I wondered at the time why 50,000. But God had already given the revelation that the Holy Spirit is a helper, not a dictator. Now, if you don't have a old Pentecostal background like I have and know about, the, the atmosphere or the attitude of the custom or feeling, they left you that the Holy Spirit was a dictator and moody. I mean, you could, nothing you could do about the gifts operating, even speaking in tongues. Some didn't believe they could speak in tongues unless they got that same feeling they had when they first got it. And some taught that if you spoke in tongues at will, you didn't have the genuine gift of the Holy Spirit. I could tell you about a horrible, wonderful experience I went through over that situation. But I learned that it's by faith and by obedience. Come on, how many can speak in tongues anytime, any place, anywhere you want to? Just you know, put it to faith, right? But that, and then some taught that it's just a sign. It's just a sign that you've got the gift of the Holy Ghost. See, Pentecostals taught about the Baptism of the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues. When the Charismatics came along, they talked about getting the, you know, Charismata with glossolalia. I remember when Dennis Bennett and I, well, I told you yesterday about, was praying in this Church of Christ for people, and he would just lay hands on them, and they got the Charismata with glossolalia. I lay hands on Jesus' name. Fill the Holy Ghost. You know, same Holy Ghost, is different charge, you know. But that's the reason they were called charismatics, because they preached on getting the charismata and glossolalia, which means a gift of speaking in tongues. All right, now, but how many are glad you get it regardless of what you call it? All right. Now, so the Holy Ghost was a dictator. To dance before the Lord, you had to be in the Spirit. You ever heard of that? And, it, and in the Spirit wasn't like we do now that we learned in the latter rain movement to praise him in a dance. It was a wild Indian dance, you know, wild American Indian dance, you know, and you couldn't control it. And if you, and if you could, if you got hurt, it was flesh, flesh, flesh. So you had to, you know, you just usually you spawn in the circle and you fell, boom. And if you act like you had anything to do with it, flesh, flesh, flesh. I, you don't know. I see you. You're all Presbyterians. You don't know. How to... <laughs> Let me quickly tell you this experience. I started pastoring at 19, and I just come. I've been in the latter rain movement long enough to praise by faith. Everything was by faith, not by feeling, not by wildness. And I was trying to. God was trying to transition me. So I'm, I'm going to tell you this because God's trying to transition us into the Third Reformation. And if you hang on to the old, you're going to have problems. So I was still trying to be old Pentecostal and latter rain. I was trying to praise him by faith and still have that. Because I'd, I had fallen, I'd danced and fallen three times. I became the white tornado, made a brand new path down the chairs, you know. 
And then when I was through, I would just go, boop, boop, hit softly on the ground. Well, that happened in Oklahoma. That happened in Texas. Then when I went to Bible college, it happened once. Then when I started pastoring, I was still single and pastoring and 19 years old. And this um, pastor, this evangelist came to hold meetings for me. And the Holy Spirit started moving. And we started singing right now, right now. Let the Savior bless your soul right now. And for an hour and 10 minutes, we sang that same chorus. People started dancing and rejoicing. The piano player was on the platform, was only two steps down. She had her eyes shut. She's playing the piano, had her eyes shut, started dancing, danced all the way down, circling dance, with her eyes shut, danced back up, sat back down the piano, and started playing again. I mean, <laughs> tried to go in circles and do that. And when there was a lot of manifestations in Pentecost that were supernatural and unusual. And then there were some of the others. And... Um, <laughs> So I'm down front, we're dancing, I'm just dancing, you know, and I feel like I'm dancing with an angel, and, I'm, and after about 20 minutes, I feel like, well, it's time to change the service. But in my great immaturity then, I thought, I can't just open my eyes and look out, they'll say, flesh, flesh, flesh. So <laughs> I, I thought to myself, well, every time before when I've danced, I've, I've gone in a circle, and I've fallen and that ends it and that's where you so you know you can get stuck on some ideas and uh, so I thought I'd try to help the Holy Spirit out so I was dancing along and I went in a spin laying out a blood curdling scream <laughs> boom cement floor no carpet my head hit the little board altar on the way down and I landed in front and I said, okay. And next day they said, what'd you see? I didn't tell them, say stars, stars. <laughs> <laughs> so when I, when I fell, it sounded like a sack of potatoes dropped from a seedling and hit the floor. And everybody just went silent. <laughs> you know. And the evangelist said, it's okay, folks, just the power of God. Everybody praise the Lord. Shut your eyes, praise the Lord. He got them all praising the Lord, and he ran down and felt my pulse, see if I was dead. <laughs> <laughs> so being the old country boy I was, I laid there and thought, maybe I, I just lay here and I'll get up. And I laid my, raised my head over this way, and it came up about this much higher than that side. <laughs> so I knew I had a knot about that big on my head. So I can't get up now, I got hurt. Flesh, flesh, flesh. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'll, I'll just lay here and rub it. But then when I raised my head back this way, it stuck to the cement, kind of. So I knew I was bleeding, but I knew the angle of it went under the pulpit, under the platform, I cleaned the church, so nobody would see the blood running out. Because <laughs> then it was flesh, flesh, but yeah. So I laid there, the preacher preached, he had an altar call, and I was waiting for everybody to leave. Everybody left, everybody left, until my future mother-in-law and wife and her friend, they would not leave. And finally, about 1 o'clock in the morning, I got up, and oh, did I have a headache. <laughs> <laughs> but the Lord, you know, I, I was trying so hard to stay in the spirit, I got in the flesh. <laughs> because, see, God was trying to transition me from the old to the new. Come on. Now, if it says praise him with the dance, I just do it. Come on. But see, that, that didn't happen until 1954. I was at the meeting in 1954 in, Van, in uh, North Surrey, B.C., Canada, where the Spirit of God swept in, and all we Lateran folks started dancing with our eyes open. <laughs> and and was, as far as I can tell in history, that was the first time there was the breakthrough of praise in the dance. And now you just come into it automatic. You don't realize the price we paid with headaches and all that stuff. <laughs> you know, so the Holy Spirit was a dictator. He, ah, you couldn't do anything unless he controlled it. Or, and he had to be very nice. Or he's temperamental. He'll run away. But we found out he's a helper. Everybody's a helper. He come to help. One translation says he's a friend. He's a helper. I mean, he's a comforter. So I like to help her. So God gave that revelation that you can actually 
ask the Holy Spirit to help you in something, he'll help. So we had about 1,000 people, 1,200 people there. And I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to war against the plans of hell to kill 60,000 Americans. We're going to save 50,000. That's what God told us. And so I said, we're going to name it. We're going to say everything we know in our own native tongue language. And we're going to describe the spirit. We're going to describe what we're fighting for. And we're going to shout. And we shouted that great shout of faith like I explained to you Sunday. And we shouted and shouted till we got the victory, we felt. But then I said, we've got to finish this up. Now, I want you all, we're going to put, start praying in your warfare tongue. How many has got a warfare tongue? You know, I have a tongue for worship. I have a tongue for praying. I have a tongue for warfare. Amen? There's, there's diversities of tongues you can have. And um, so I said, we're going to ask the Holy Ghost to have every one of us pray for the same thing at the same time in our own spirit language. And we went to war and battle. We battled for several minutes. Well, sure enough, they had sent thousands of body bags over there, but hardly any allies were killed. And I wondered about this 60,000. We were going to take 50. Three weeks later, I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to a prophetic church, and I was telling them about our experience, and the pastor jumped up and said, that same night, God told us to save 10,000, and we went to war for 10,000 there. See, we don't have to do it all. God decides different assignments to different one of us. Amen? Now, it also says, Romans 8, 26 and 27, it says he makes intercession for us, and he prays according to the will of God. Probably the only time I could guarantee you 100% you're praying in the will of God is when you're praying in tongues. See, he prays according to the will of God. That's good, and then it's another way, too. See, sometimes you pray, oh, God, make me popular. Give me success. Give me, give me this car, this home. Give me, give me, give me, give me. And the Holy Ghost, then he starts going, oh, da, da, da. And the Holy Ghost says, Lord, he's getting proud. He's getting too materialistic. Lord, take him through this process. <laughs> See, you'd never pray that. Now, don't be afraid to let the Holy Ghost pray according to the will of God. <laughs> yeah, he'll, he'll, pray, he'll tell on you. He'll pray where it should be prayed. Amen. Now, let me tell you about prophetic intercession. We've got any intercessors here? Nobody intercessors? An intercessor, wave your hand. How many prayer warriors we got here? How many human beings we have here? Okay. <laughs> I'll get you one way or the other. All right. You know, I'm looking forward to the day. Got to get my Ray Cola so I stay juicy. I'm looking forward to the day, and I put in this book a challenge. I would like to have a million people that are so sensitive to the Spirit, they'll pray in tongues at least 30 minutes a day, and there'll come a day when we need a worldwide miracle. And the Holy Spirit can touch all one million to pray in their own time zone at the same time and if one can put a thousand to fly, two can put ten thousand to fly. What can a million do? Amen. I used to wonder how Jesus said he's at the right hand of God, Romans 8, 34, making intercession for the saints. Until he showed me, I really believe one way, he makes intercession for the saints through the saints. Now, he's praying to the Father, raise up those who are sensitive to where I can pray through them. Amen? Eyes of the Lord are running to and fro. Now, don't visualize eyeballs running around. God's TV scanner, whatever you want to say, is looking for those who he can use. Let me give you an example. When I was in Bible college, there was a couple who came through, and they'd been missionaries in Borneo, and um, they told this experience. They um, decided to go way up river. This is in the late 40s. They decided to go way up river to where tribes were there that had never seen civilization, and for sure, I'd never seen a white person. And um, so and Sister Northrop grabs up this big bunch of bananas to, to have something to eat on the way and nibble. They travel most of the day, and it gets mid-afternoon, and they're going up, and she picks up this bunch of bananas, get ready to share it, and suddenly out of the trees and out of the side of the river, natives jump in with spears and swords, and, and they jump in, grab their boat, bring them over the shore, and start marching them up to the king. And they go for ways to the, uh, to the um, tribe where it meets there. And the king is sitting on the throne. And uh, 
all the warriors are painted, and they got spears and swords, and this sister Northrop and a couple other people that were with them are now prisoners, and they're standing there, and then the old witch doctor comes out to check them out because he had to check them out to see if they're good or bad for the village. So he would come around, you know, Rah! you know, just gyrating noise and doing his thing. And this went on for a few minutes, and, and they knew they was going to die. But the Lord spoke to Sister Northrop. He says, now, that witch doctor comes by again, opens his mouth real wide, and ah, I want you to take off the biggest banana you can get off that bunch and ram it as far down his throat as you can. And she thought, Lord, we're in enough trouble as it is. None of these warriors would dare do such a thing. We'll be killed. And, the, and he came by, and she, she wouldn't do it. And God says, do it. And she thought, well, we're going to die anyhow. Might as well. <laughs> so he comes by again. <laughs> Woof! Down his throat. He falls on the ground. Choking. <laughs> and, and all the warriors freeze. Because that woman did something none of them would dare do. And suddenly they hear the king going, <laughs> he said, bring me that woman that's brave enough to do what none of my bravest warriors would do is to ram a banana down my witch doctor's throat. <laughs> and to make a long story short, he said, I want to know your God that makes you that brave. The whole village got saved and many others. Amen. Now, Here's the real key to the story. When they get back home, they're telling this to their home church, and a sister uh, uh, calls, meets them after and says, I want you to come home with me. I want to share something with you. And they go home, and she says, they check their time, zone, and, and days, and she said, there was this day that the Holy Spirit started dealing with me to pray in tongues and intercede, and I did it for four hours before I felt a release. And they checked the time. She started praying in tongues and intercession the moment that the warriors jumped in the river after them. And she didn't feel release until the king got saved in the village. Now, that life of that missionaries and the salvation of that village really depended on that woman's intercession. I used to wonder, I'm hearing stories about Muslims having visions of Jesus and, and Iran and different places, getting saved. And I thought, I've, I've always preached it takes a human instrument for God to use or work with anybody. And I asked the Lord, how are they getting saved without a human instrument? He said, there is a human instrument. I had this sister pray in tongues for that man over there. I had this brother pray in tongues for that man over there. Amen. The Bible says, pray with all prayer and supplication for all saints everywhere. Holy Spirit's the only one that knows everywhere. And he will pray. And God's looking for intercessors. How many, has ever, how many here have ever had God just hit you with intercession and you just felt compelled to pray? When you do, don't stop till joy and peace comes. Don't stop till you've got the victory. Amen. And I want you to know God is looking for those that will work with him and move in the will of God. I, I, there's so many things. That's only about seven or eight out of 70. How many realize you've got something bigger, better, greater than you realized? Amen. Stand up. Hallelujah. Now, I want everyone here that's never spoken in tongues, come forward. We're going we're gonna to get you talking in tongues. Everybody that does not speak in tongues, get, get, get out. Wave your hand. Let them, let them out. You, 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 or you can't speak in tongues very easily. You just All you can do is tut, tut, tut. Is there anybody here that does not speak in tongues? I hope everybody is. But even at prophetic apostolic kingdom conferences, you'll have some people. I was just with Pat Francis in Toronto at a kingdom congress, and I gave an invitation like this, and 50 came up to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How many here speak fluently in tongues? Wave your hand. Let me see. Look around and see if anybody doesn't raise their hand. If they didn't, grab them, bring them down front. <laughs> now, If, if, if we just knew all that it could do for you, amen? He doesn't have it. Okay, come on. She doesn't have it. I'm, I know there's several more here. Come on up. 
Don't be ashamed of it. Come on up. Up in the balcony or third floor, come on down, whoever. There are several here. Come on while I talk. Come on down from the, up in the balcony, up in the third floor, wherever you are, out in the parking lot, wherever you are. Come on in. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. There's room over here in the middle. Come over here in the middle. Come on. We'll get, we're, going, we're going to give you time. Remember, Jesus said, it's best that I go away. Because if I don't go away, I can't send you back your own spirit language. Your greatest friend, your greatest helper is your spirit language for a Christian. Once you get Jesus in your heart, or get Christ in you, the hope of glory, is your greatest friend. Amen? Now, I'll tell you what I want. Now, how many here have never spoken in tongues? How many? Never. Have you ever spoken in tongues? Never. Never? Never. Okay, never. None of them. All right. Now, I want, come on, all, all your ministers, I want somebody behind each one of them. Uh, Helen, organize them, please. Get some people. Come on. Come on, ministers. Come up and help us. Now, you that's still coming to get in line, get in line up here. See, it's about 30 of us up here. Amen. Come on, everybody get behind one. And I'm going to pray for you, and you're going to receive the gift. Amen. Now, the gift, it's a gift. What do you do to receive a gift? Let me see if I got something here to valuable enough to give away. My wife's not here, so now here's a ten dollar bill. Let's say if I said to this young man here, what's your name? What is it? Jeffrey. Jeffrey. I said, Jeffrey, I give you this ten dollar bill. Have I given it? I've said it, I give it. But does he have it? Why doesn't he have it? It's here, not there. Come on. You got it. Now, that's the way. It's yours now. You keep it. All right, you see? You see, I gave it, but if he hadn't have made the move and come up, it wouldn't have been his. He had to reach out and receive it. Now, it's a gift. Is there more here that needs, uh, I think, some of these... Um, come on up on the platform here, maybe we'll get some more up here. Somehow I'll get them where we, how many, find out those that's coming for the, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, you got this, you got the Holy Spirit when you got saved, you got born again. But this is the Holy Spirit's gift, which is given to your redeemed spirit to direct your vocal organs to pray in a language you never prayed in before. They did a study scientifically on the front lobe of the brain. Paul says, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is inactive. Amen? And they took these electrons, and they took it, monks praying, Catholic nuns praying, and Holy Ghost tongue, people talking in tongues. And when the monks prayed, or when the Catholic nuns prayed, their frontal lobe was very active. But when the saints were praying in tongues, it was inactive. A scientific proof that you're praying from your spirit. Now, it's a gift. Now, the Bible says they spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance. The word utterance means the ability to articulate into a language. Are you with me? So when we, when we pray for you and they lay hands on you and behind you, I'm going to pray for you. And you, 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 how many of you are, are, you know that your sins are under the blood? How many of you know you're a Christian? Raise your hand. You know you're a Christian? Have you, you know? You everybody know? Okay. Let's make sure everybody's a Christian. You're up here. You've accepted Christ. Been cleansed by the blood. Okay. Very good. Now, so here's what we're going to do. When I, when I start praying for you, I want you to, we're going to pray this prayer together first. Father God, I'm your child. You promised the gift of the Holy Spirit that I could receive if I believe. I believe to receive. I've asked for the spirit language. And what I ask for, that's exactly what you will give. I trust you, believe you, and I have faith to take action. Amen. Now, here's what we're going to do. 
I'm going to pray for you. They're going to lay hands on you. When I do, you open your mouth, and if you have to talk and Jesus, I love you a few moments, but you can't stay that long, then you switch channels from mind-directed to spirit-directed. And you say, Jesus, I love you. Thank you, God, for the Holy Ghost. It just starts articulating those, you know. For me to speak in your Malaysian language it would sound strange to me. Come on. For you to speak my Oki lingo, it sounds strange to you, <laughs> you know. So it's going to sound strange to your ears. And it doesn't come from here, though you may see and sense things, syllables, sounds. You just have to let it flow and let it articulate. Amen? You say, how do I do it? By faith. How do I know what I'm saying? You never do. <laughs> Amen? All these people, how many here speak in tongues? Wave your hand. Look at them. Hundreds, hundreds, and hundreds. Wave. And there's over 600 million have received this gift and speak in tongues. 600 million. Amen? All right. Are you ready to receive? Now, we're going to pray God fill up your reservoir. You're going to open the water gate. And you're going to let the river flow out of your, on your turban, your tongue, and you're going to start speaking in a new language. No two of you sound just exactly alike. And you'll, th you'll think it's you doing it. It is. He gave you the ability. Holy Ghost doesn't need to talk in tongues. You need that ability. Are you with me? So it's your gift, and you will direct it from your spirit. Amen? It's Holy Ghost anointed. Are you ready to receive? Okay. We've got ministers and somebody else with everyone. Okay. All right. Okay? All right. Lay hands on them as I pray. The saints are going to lay hands. Preachers are going to lay hands. Father God, in Jesus' name, you promised the Holy Spirit you died not only to forgive us our sins, but to give us this great gift, this great power of spirit language. And right now we're hungry, we're thirsty. And you said, they that hunger and thirst shall receive. And right now we speak in the name of Jesus. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Switch. Start speaking in tongues. Make those sounds and syllables out of your mouth. Work with them. Come on, work with them. Work with them. Feel the Holy Ghost. Speak it out. Speak it out. Speak it out, speak it out. Reba Bokoto Rada Baranda. Reba Bokoto Rada Baranda. Yes, you're being filled. You're being gifted. Reba Bokoto Rada Baranda. All right. Listen, see if they're speaking. Help them. Work with them. Work with them. Reba Bokoto Rada Baranda. Work with them. Reba Bokoto Rada Baranda. Reba Bokoto Rada Baranda. Oh, yeah. Come on, pray in tongues. Charge the atmosphere. Charge the atmosphere with the power of God. Let the river flow. Flood this place. Speak it out. Speak it out. Speak yeah, yeah, come on, saints, come on, saints, charge, charge, charge. Help her, come around, help her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're filled. Speak it out. They spoke. You speak. Looks like everybody's speaking. Come on. Come on. Everybody's getting it. Everybody's getting it good. Come on, saints. Charge the atmosphere. Charge the atmosphere. Charge the atmosphere. 
Speak it out loud. Let the river, not a squirt gun, river, 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 let it flow, let it flow out of your innermost being. Speak it out. Speak it out. You got it. You got it. Come on. You got it. Flow with it. Speak it out loud. Come on. Let the river out loud. Come on. Get out loud. Get loud. Loud. Get loud. Get loud. Speak it out loud. Speak it out loud. Speak it out loud. Yeah, 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 come on. Charge, charge, charge. Hallelujah. 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 Come on. Pray, pray, pray in tongues. Come on. Let the river flow. Let the river flow. Hallelujah, come on, pray, 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 pray. Hallelujah, let the river flow. Just open your mouth, open your mouth and speak it. Shirianda <laughs> Oh, Siri andari andara la 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 ma. Ke ma ba 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 sukuri yaka ba ba sikiri andara la 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 la. Ke ma ba 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 sukuri andara la 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 ma. Kuri alama sikiri andari andara la 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 ma. That's right. That's right. Let the Holy Spirit come through. Let the Holy Spirit come through. Let the Holy Spirit come through. Let the river flow. Let the river flow. Ka ba 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 sakari andara alama. Ki ma ba 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 sikiri andara alama. Ka ba 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 sikiri andara alama. Just open your mouth and say it. Say it. Say it. Declare it. Ka ba 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 sakara la la ma ba. Shiki ki ka 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 ka. Hallelujah. Let the river flow everywhere. Rivers of living water. Let there be rivers of living water. Let there be rivers of living water. Let it spring up, spring up. Let it spring up. Shiri alama ba sakara la la ma ka ba ba ka sakara ba la ma. Kiri alama ba sikiri andara la 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 ma. You drink as much, drink as much and speak as much. Let it flow like a river. Ka ba 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 ba. Ka ba 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 ba. Siki ki 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 ki. Ruru mu sakara la la ma ba ba Ke ba 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 sakara la la ma Ke ra la ma sukuri anda Amen 
Hallelujah. Amen. Those of you standing here, just listen. I call this an amazing work because I tried to teach Zara her first words. I said, Grandpa, Grandpa, Grandpa. She looks at me and never says. But you thought she's not hearing. But I, suddenly, after many months, the first or the, among the second words that she spoke is Grandpa. It's just like a car battery. One that is dead, somebody else is helping. Just by charging, by connecting two spirits together, the car battery that has no, no life comes alive. Sometimes you don't have it, but the Holy Spirit can charge your spirit. And charge your spirit and give you the same language. So I, in all my years, there's been very few people who have never spoken in tongues. I said, look, if you don't know what to say, just use, borrow a few of my battery words. I say, whatever you can follow, just follow. When I stop, you don't stop, you just start. It's called kickstart. It's called kickstart. You know, the evangelists say, Father, come, Lord Jesus. You say, Lord Jesus. He says, Lord Jesus. You borrow his words. Sometimes it's not very difficult. You just hear what others are saying, and you know your, your, your spirit can just connect. I said, yes, I can say that. Yeah, karaba shandaralaba. Then when he stops, you just continue. The battery is charged already. Yes. It's not impossible. You can have it. Can we try one more time? Yes. You listen. And then I, when I finish, you start. Is that okay? It doesn't go to the mind. It goes to the spirit. So it's not something you're going to understand. Every one of us can do that. Are you ready? Kura la la ba shakari yanda la la ba shikiri yanda. Okay, you take it. You take the words. Kura yanda la la ba shakara ba la ba shikiri yanda la 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 ba. Everybody receive it. Kura la ma ba shakara la ba. That's it. That's that's the way. That's the way to go. Kuri ya la ma shakara la ma shin. That's it. You continue. It's your turn. Kuri ya la ma ba shakari yanda la 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 ma shikiri yanda la la ma. That's it. You don't have to shake. You don't have to shout. You just say it. Kira la ma sakara la la ma baba shikiri ala baba sada. Doing good. Kura la ma shikiri. That's it. That's the way to go. Kuri ala ma ba sakara la la ma ba. Kiri ala ma siri andara la 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 ma. Let it flow like a river. Let it flow like a river. Let it flow like a river. Rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. Thank you, Jesus. From this day henceforth, let it flow. From this day henceforth, let it flow. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the river. Thank you for the river. Hallelujah. That's it. Oh, Spirit of God, Spirit of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Just like every language, practice makes perfect. If you know a few words of French, you keep speaking and you learn a little bit more, the Holy Spirit gives you utterance. That means He gives you more words. So you start a little, then every day you begin to grow as you start to speak more and more language. So sometimes we can get distracted with other things. So when we're praying in tongues, suddenly we feel heat, we feel hot. We don't get distracted, just let, it, let the language go. Because the other manifestations must not confuse you. Why do I feel hot in one year? I don't know. Some people are hot in the left ear, some are hot in the right ear. It doesn't matter. The language is what we want. Amen. Sometimes you feel your hands are hot. One hand is hot, the other hand is not so hot. 
so it doesn't matter. Maybe circulation is bad, but get your tongue first. <laughs> but when tongues are through, you get better and better. Amen? Yes. Amen. God bless you. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Keep practicing the language. Because you become more and more proficient in the language you practice.